Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I can't call it experimental theater, but in a sense it is, because it, it crosses the line between educational theater and drama in education. Uh, the Boxton Theater Arts Group and I met about three weeks ago. Um, and they agreed to rescue me because the teachers, the actual teachers who were supposed to do this performance are caught up in their examinations. And I could not convince them that the creative work, the creative arts is more important than examinations. So it is a fortunate accident, I think a divine accident, that I met the Boxton Arts Theater. And we, are, we have now begun to work together. I'm hoping it's not the first and last time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Karen, Karen Wharton. I'm one of the organizers from New York, uh, collaborating with the group here in Guyana, or the groups here in Guyana. And this morning, we're absolutely delighted to have Miss Charlene Wilkinson and the Buxton Theater Art Arts Group, right? And uh, Charlene, uh, I'm not sure how much she told you of herself about herself, but she is a lecturer at UG. Uh, she uh, has been teaching for years and years and years, Ryan. She's, pr <laughs> she's very interested in the arts and in language, Ryan. Uh, and I know she's uh, collaborating today uh, with uh, a, a group of young people from Buxton, Ryan. Uh, and the topic or, or of the drama, it's a drama, will be uh, who's speaking like that, Ryan. And, uh, Basically, it's about the role of Creolese in education. Uh, you know, Guyana, the official language is English, but we all speak something else at various times, so we code switch. Uh, sometimes we speak proper English, right? Like I'm supposed to speak proper English today, right now, and sometimes we don't, right? Uh, and in many classrooms, uh, children and teachers speak both. Ryan. And so today's drama is, will explore how Creolese uh, affects uh, learning in the classroom. So I'd like you to put your hands together, Ryan, and welcome Miss Charlene Wilkinson and the Buxton Theater Arts Group. Thank you. Once upon a time, in a primary school classroom, a young boy goes home and his mother is concerned about his homework and his general performance. This is the. It's not myself. Not myself. Not yeah, we are Simple, simple, the book full of notes, but you can't read. 
read them simple words. So you that well we might as well go into the school and find out what's going on. Alright, no problem. Mm -hmm. Good, let's go.
any of God animal? No, no miss. Why? Because they have good purpose. Good purpose. You know the purpose of the cracker? Miss, the cracker does kill cockroach. And mosquito? Yes. yes. And the modern is, um, tell me, the word is proper one frog. And at six o'clock time, <coughs> let us come out here. We are and jump. like toad and yeah. jumping all over. Yes, my father tell me that. Them big, I want to get them to see good, good. All right. Yes. So wait now, let me see. Now, if you kill the cracker, the cracker can try and eat the mosquito. And the fly. And the fly and the cockroach. Yes. It can able to kill, um, kill it or eat it if you kill the frog. No. 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 So, would you do it again? No. You know anything else but crackle? Miss if it, Miss if then, if all the crackle dead out, they get enough fly and all the fly and land on your food, and the food and get germs, and mother gonna tell you throw it away because it eats it and get germs. I mean, I'll get enough mosquito and I'll get Zico. Miss if then, you'll get AIDS. And my father said the mosquito eat them pets on their pants too, so my father get good plant we not go sell a food up. And, 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 and. <laughs> so because the frog will eat the mosquito and eat the pest, your father get good, good plant with the papa mosquito and pest. You see? So we all see Quacko is a good pet. A good pet. If you want, is that true? Quacko is a good pet, right? Yes. Good. Class, just one minute. Class, good morning. Please stand and tell this. Good. Education good. officer, good morning. Good, good morning, morning, sir. And welcome to grade two Buttercup. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. May I have a word? Sure, sir. All right. Y'all remember all that we talked about? That is, crap, it has a purpose, right? Yes. Miss, how are the children speaking so atrocious? Aren't you teaching them proper English? But sir, say it. And our discussion really should end, should um, surround today how, I just want to get some feedback from the audience, what they think about what they saw. Be honest, brutally honest. And then let's look at the three questions we have on the program. What is the role of English? What is the role of Creolese? And how can we teach English without undermining the children's self-confidence? Um, but I'm supposed to invite Mr. Hussein, right? Okay. So, so does anyone have any comments or questions? Good morning. My name is Charles Liverpool. Um, I'm coming from Atlanta, Georgia. I hailing from Ansgrove by way of Buxton. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. And I'm passionate about this kind of stuff, the arts, reading, writing, poetry, acting. I don't act, I write the stuff. But this drama, dramatic expression just now tells me that there's passion here and there's talent here. And I thank you and you and you and you for bringing this. What's intriguing though is that I don't know how much acting experience these folks have had or these youths have had, but it's good. We all have some creative something in us. And if we can just get that out, share it somehow, develop it some way, it will make much difference in our lives. Take a something. Do, do something with us, do something with your life, make a difference, build a dream. And this is what I think this arts theater is all about. Kids, are, they get despondent, and we have to find a way to help them 
develop that something in them. I'm not going to take much more of your time. Anyone else can share. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liverpool. So, well, one of the things that I found to be particularly interesting, and uh, I left Guyana when I was 15 years old. I've been gone for a while. I go and come. I live in the US. I have a daughter. Uh, obviously, I'm black, right? And so what does that mean in the US? And so in the US, we have a similar thing where, uh, you know, the many young black people or black people in general speak what we what is called, what is referred to as ebonics right which is english just like creolese but it the syntax may be a little different just like creolese right and so you we we have to wonder when kids go to school what is the role of the teacher and how is it that we educate kids Ryan, uh, we saw in the, in the drama, Ryan, uh, that there was a wealth of knowledge that the kids actually had about the crapo, Ryan. Uh, but how does the teacher encourage and nurture kids in the classroom, Ryan? You know, the question is, is it absolutely necessary for all of us to speak the Queen's English in school or even out? Right? Like, what is, what is education, right? How are we, you know, when you go to school and you're, you're supposed to learn, what is the learning process? Is, are you going to school to simply learn to speak English, proper English, or are you going to school to acquire certain skills, certain knowledge, right? English being one of them. So what I saw, right, was the kids in the first, seeing with the teacher, right? They were not being encouraged to explore, right? Explore their base, their knowledge base. She basically was, in, was, 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 was stifling their growth by demanding that they use certain terminologies that they may not have been familiar with, right? And yes, you know, if you're writing an English essay in Guyana, you probably would want to write frog, right? But there is a way that I feel that that can be encouraged, right? Not on the onset, it's not crapo, it's frog, and just stop the discussion right there. So I think, you know, that's what I'm walking away from. I don't know, I would be interested in hearing what, you, what, what your takeaway is, but my takeaway has been that, you know, when we send our kids to school or when we go to school or any kind of learning situation here, for instance, that uh, we need to encourage communication, Ryan. When we're having, when we're in an English class, then we're going to do, you know, sentence construction and those kinds of things. And yeah, we're going to encourage each other to speak properly, but that is not the sole purpose of education. What do you think? What I want to um, inform the audience is that I deliberately asked the videographer to come in, so that in fact you are all research subjects, and I'm actually collecting data here this morning. So if you don't want to be recorded. If you don't want me to use your contribution, please say so before you leave, you know, after you leave. Because I ultimately, this is a very political motive I have for doing this, because there's a small group of people at UG who would like the government to move to a language policy that acknowledges it's very dubious, it's an unspoken policy, as you saw in the program, it's an unspoken, it's unwritten, it's not unspoken, it's unwritten policy that we should accept the Creolese, but we must allow them to say it so that we can translate it to the better way for them. So at the bottom of that is still a sense that Creolese is really not good enough, that ultimately to negotiate school knowledge, you have to do it in English. And this is... This is what I would like to ask you today to, co to contribute to that discourse. I've been a teacher too, and um, we had a policy where I taught that said, if a child cannot learn in the language, in the official language, 
which they don't understand. You teach, the, it's the teacher's job to teach them in the language that they can understand. So we always broke it down and we put nobody down if they couldn't speak perfect English. But uh, I see Dr. Robertson at the end. I want to say hi to him. He was one of our lecturers in linguistics when I first started here at UG in my first year. I know Alim is also an expert in the language field. But I don't know how you are going across this big divide of letting the children, we have to coach them, we have to teach them to pass the CXC English or the CXC syllabus, and all of that is English, is standard in, in standard English. So I think the government has, and the advocates would ha have their work cut out for them so that CXC can ask, devise their programs and, or their examinations in some way that can have some input of the Creole. But what I want to say is that apart from writing the, um, the regulated subjects in the English language, there are uses, other uses, and equally important uses for the Creolese and that is in the creative arts, of which we've seen one example in, in the drama. There's also a scope for writing Creolese in the novel, in your short stories, in your poetry. It's very, very valid for you to write a short story or a novel. I mean, when Sel Sam Selvon went to England, what do you think he wrote his novels in? In his narrative language was the language that he spoke in Trinidad, and it was not the cross your eyes agreement with grammar, subject and verb agreement, plural agreement. It was just as he spoke in the Creole. So that I think that if I'm marking a set of papers and a child submits a poetry, a poem in, in the Creolese, I would, I would not put that, that um, poem down because I think that that's the creative thing. Because when you're writing creative, when you're doing creative writing, all sorts of mythology, old hag, and so on come out in your writing, all the mythology of how these Caribbean islands, including Guyana. And so you need the authentic language to bring out those subjects that you want to talk about. But, but if I may ask, uh, even with CXC, I, uh, is there anything, what is fundamentally wrong with being bilingual? Like why can't we, why can't we, you know, I'm just throwing it out there, why can't we speak Creolese, right, and write? proper English, right? I mean, you know, even sometimes the way ink, um, writing is taught, right, to little kids is, you know, don't think about the English, yeah. right? Just write, what, just write, free flow, and then we'll come back and worry about grammar, right? So that's one way, but I, I, I'm exploring, standing here exploring, like, what is, why, why, why can't a child be bilingual? Why can't a child speak, Cre or families speak Creolese and write English? Right. Right? No, there's nothing wrong with being my, bilingual. When my grandparents came here from India, my grandfather was speaking about nine different dialects of India, including the standard, the Pashtung, the I, I can't stand here and relate at all. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the child being bilingual. He could be bilingual in Creole English, in Standard English, in French, in Portuguese, just as we want. You know, the rest of us, we did had to do all of that in school as we grew up. So, but the trouble is getting the certifying people to accept that, and that's where the government 
and the lobbying with the government must come in to, to get this certifying people to not to fail the children if they offer in those languages. Yes, Thank you. Thomas. Uh, good morning. So I, I wanted to commend the, the young people for a very wonderful performance and to commend uh, 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 Dr. Wilkinson for, for, for bringing it to us. Uh, I'm not a linguist and so my comments will be not those of a linguist but of a mathematician. And so my colleague here just mentioned that her parents came from India and uh, her grandparents came from India and, and I, I say a few years ago I visited India uh, to do mathematics, and so she's right. There, there are many, many languages spoken in India, except that there's one language which is spoken and dealt with above all these languages, and that language is English. So if you go to in India to study mathematics, you go to India to study medicine, you go to India to study anything, you will find in the Indian universities, uh, you'll find that English is the language that is spoken, and the particular kind of English that you know, the teacher who we didn't like so much, uh, 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 <laughs> the teacher who we didn't like so much, you know, we, we, we didn't like her. For, and so the question is to explore, it's not, I, I don't think it's, it's that English is the bad thing. As, as, as my colleague uh, Karen Wharton notes, English is really vitally important. And perhaps what's important is that we become bilingual and we become, and I, I thought the, the second teacher who we liked a lot more, who's sort of a teacher more like me, say that there is a language in which we all speak. And we should privilege that language in the learning in the classroom. So we should learn in ways that are in tune, that are resonant with our social identities. It should be resonant in the way in which we speak. So in this classroom, to talk about a crapo and a frog, it's important because the students understand crap, but they also need to understand that when they go to London, as they will when they finish these CXE exams, that they will need to know that it's a frog. And no one will stand and say, you know, it's a crapo and you did it in your place in that way. It's already been established a certain kind of global hege hegemony of English. And you can go to Russia at a mathematical conference, it'll be done in English. You can go to Sweden, it will be done in English. So. We're fortunate in Guyana, at least from my perspective, that we speak English readily. As someone noted, we're the only English-speaking place on the, on, the, on the South American part of the world, and it's our advantage, and I think we should cultivate it. We should be asking why are not more people coming here to learn English from us? Why are not the Venezuelans, the Surinamese, the Portuguese? So as we have this discussion, I would want to say, not only think about what's happening in Guyana, but understand that all of you young people here are not only living in Guyana. As you can see, we travel quite easily. It's, I don't know, at most four or five hours between New York City and Guyana. It's at most six hours between New York City, between Guyana and the United Kingdom. It's at most, I don't know, maybe 15, 17 hours between Guyana and India, and you get there quite easily. And so there's a way in which you won't be living in the world of our parents. You'll be living in a world that is of the future, and so I think you need to balance this thing with importance, it is very, very vitally important. You're, you're not going to read any technical books that are written in Creole. It, it's just not that. So you need to understand it. And, but you also need to understand it. In order to really understand it, you have to be able to say it in your own way, in your own people. And that's, and that's the vital thing. So you have to do both of these. I don't think you can do one or the other. You have to do both of them. And, and I would be remiss if I sat here and told you that it would, it's, it's not the truth. Everyone, my name is Sonika Henry, and I would also like to commend the Buxton Art Theatre for what they did this morning. Um, from the responses, I can tell that um, what they showed us um, had its effect. We are already talking about the teacher that we liked and the teacher we didn't like. And it has nothing to do with the fact that we love all the actors, but we just prefer the way this young lady, for example, was able to say so much and was so talkative and exciting, you know, to listen to. Um, what, what I would like to point out, however, is that at the moment it's very true, as you said, that we won't read books in Creolese, but I want us to think about the future. Guyana in 2030, why shouldn't there be books, scientific books in Creolese, why not? because that's what our children are speaking, and they are speaking it perfectly. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the Creolese that our students speak. 
what's wrong is our attitude when they speak it. We think, we think it's not um, going to, they're not going to make it. Now, why not? Um, yes, we have students who need help with English. And I like to bring this as an example. As a teacher of English as a second language, I have Chinese speaking students, Portuguese speaking students, and yet at CXC level, by the time they reach that level, they excel and they do better than our Guyanese students. By the time they get to university, wherever they go, they are not asked to take an exam to prove they can speak English, as some of our Guyanese students are asked to do they actually pass those exams with no problem at all. So what is the difference? We are using, and because I happen to have that experience with um, Chinese and Portuguese and so on, I am able to teach those children English, also taking into account what they um, bring with them. So their language is not ignored when we teach them English. That was one of the things that was um, crucial in their learning of English. And so if we transfer that method or that attitude to our children, it means that we will acknowledge that they speak a language perfectly at home, which is Creolese or Guyanese Creole. And when they come to school, they learn English just as the, others, as the speakers of other languages do. And they learn it perfectly. So we no longer have a situation of, in, of um, people considering Creolese as being a kind of English, but not a proper one, but rather Creolese as being a language on its own. It has a different structure, different grammar. And then English, which is taught, and because we're an English-speaking country, can be a language that they master very quickly at primary level and no longer bring this um, broken English into secondary and tertiary level, right? And I think if we start there, we have um, a chance to change our landscape completely because then we don't undermine the confidence of our children as we saw in scene one. They don't have to shut up because they don't know how to say it properly. They can actually express themselves as they did in the second scene and use the knowledge that they have absolutely to express themselves. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to. I suppose the world wouldn't be unjust if it were exactly as you said. But what you saw here today is what is actually happening in our classrooms. What I did was give you the two extreme ends of it. The teacher who keeps shutting them down all the time, but if you listen to the teacher properly, they were, well, we didn't get enough of the teacher, but there were times when you recognize that the teacher herself is a learner of English. And on the, the, the higher extreme, the other extreme is the teacher who completely accommodates so that the learning process can happen, right? What is happening though, the policy, even though the policy sounds friendly, to the Creolese. The policy is saying at the f in the final analysis, they have to leave it down and get to English. They are not saying bilingualism because bilingualism means that both languages are coming up in the same way. Both languages are equal. So this is the issue here and this is why I get on the bandwagon all the time. Good morning, my name is Bernard Rollins. I'm from the city of Newark, but originally my birthplace is a ticker. Uh, born and grew there. Um, but I'm living in Newark. I'm, li I'm living in Newark for the past 30 years. Uh, and I can remember um, leaving the ticker to, go to, to come to Georgetown. Uh, it was a transition that many um, are still uh, one of the reasons why quite a lot of folks from the country don't come to the come to the city, uh, and I, I can talk about it because uh, after leaving Itika, you you either come to the police force or the teachers training college to for a better for a better the life in itself. You come to Georgetown, it's difficult to house yourself, but I think things have changed by now. Uh, during my time in Georgetown. I interacted a lot with the A-guards. Uh, Mr. A-guard, who went to school with um, uh, John Ray, right, uh, took me on his clutches. I said, well, why is it that everybody would follow me around? Because I spoke with a very heavy accent, and the accent was not something, it was very strange to my friends. 
but they didn't really they didn't really engage with me because of who Bernard was, but they engaged with me because of the accent and the things that how I, how I spoke and how, how, how I brought them to understand where I live. So when I took them to Itiko, right, and, and they saw where I live and, the, and how life, uh, how they interact with the folks there, what I want to say is that um, I think the government has got to do more in, 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 in engaging the countryside and, and the city. Um, University of Guyana uh, used to visit uh, Ithaca, and they were one. Of the, they, they were responsible for keeping the Quaker the uh, culture alive. And what I want to say is that um, there is some absence when it comes to the Ministry of Education and it's the, the policy. In the policy, I think there is something that's got to be developed to remember that there is a hidden culture in the countryside that you would not see until you visit. The, the, the countryside and you meet with some folks who can really introduce you properly to what's happening in the countryside so those folks in the countryside don't feel left out so they can excel or perform creditably in academia and not being afraid and the folks in the city that exchange can grow our community and grow it faster so you don't have to talk about bilingual I'm, I, I'm not against bilingual the bilingual um, language but it's to understand the, that there are many different dialects in this country that, and, and I, I, I don't understand how folks don't understand that in a place like Itiko, you hear a different dialect to, to, to quarantine, which is, um, Itiko is more Dutch and, 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 and the Dutch orientation, uh, you know, you hear, and you still have African, you have Congo, and you have uh, other Dutch uh, language. So what I'm saying is that the teacher must understand in the Ministry of Education policy, they must understand that growing or growing the, 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 the growing academia, you have to understand that there, is, there are dialects that you have to deal with to, 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 to incorporate. Look, I was afraid of mathematics, but I still got myself engaged mathematically when I come to tongue. I had to, I had to do it because the type of mathematics I did, I wasn't algebra and arithmetic and general. I did pure and applied mathematics. And that was not no easy mathematics to understand. But Mr. Agard, who went to teacher training college, he knew who Bernard Rollins was from Ithaca. And because of my integration with him, he, you know, and that closeness, we were able to work together and, you know, perform in Georgetown. So I'm saying is that the cultural division or the cultural handicap, we need to set policies in place that can, can, can grow it and, and, and have that, that Guyanese, Guy, Guyanese-ness going. <laughs> okay, thank you very and much. One other thing too, I think uh, we're focused on the language, right? But I also think that uh, we could look at teaching the delivery of education. To me, th that is an even broader discussion that we should be having, right? Because how are teachers managing kids in the classroom? How are they encouraging kids to be expressive and to explore what ideas, right, to participate, to have discussions, right? You know, I, we were, Michelle, Dr. Foster and I did a program in Guyana last year around this time with students and we were, I was a little surprised that we were still sitting in rows and columns, right? We're still, still sitting in rows and columns, and that doesn't really facilitate discussions, right? Collaboration, because basically, even look at the way we're sitting right now. Imagine if we were in a circle and we were equals, right? As a, change the room around, for this, yeah, uh, we have. <coughs> well, thank you, but but even the way it is set up now, you listen to me, Ryan, and when I stop talking, maybe you have a chance, Ryan. Whereas if 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 the if the layout is different and and we're in a circle or even smaller groups, then we're able, we're better able to exchange ideas, right? People who are a little shy, right, in a smaller group may speak up a little bit more. So I think there's a larger question too. First of all, I want to compliment the performers. They did an excellent job. I hear a lot of talk about biling bi bilingualism. 
and the use of English and Creolese in the classroom. My question is, who will teach English? The teachers themselves do not know English. So how are they expected to teach English and how do we expect both English and the Creolese to exist in the classroom? I'm going to throw a question out to Professor Robertson. Professor, how do you pronounce that word that is spelled C-R-A-P-A-U-D? How do we how do we pronounce that? How do we pronounce it? Huh? How, how do you pronounce it? I say crap -o. You say crap -o. Yeah. <laughs> But we can find that word in the, in the Oxford Dictionary, can't we? We could, and we could find also, we could find also in the dictionary of British English. So the, 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 so the point is that while the teacher vigorously corrected the children, she was corrected, correcting a word that exists in the English Dictionary. So, who teaches the English? Surprises, surprises. I didn't come here to give you any answers. <laughs> I think it's really good that we are having um, this conversation. Um, and I think, as someone mentioned before, it's not only a Guyana problem, it's a worldwide problem where English is seen as the superior language. And I think part of us, that has to do with colonialism. Um, I can speak about my own experience coming from the country, uh, writing common entrance and passing to go to a school in Georgetown, and how difficult it was because growing up in the country, you, you're speaking Creolese all the time, you know, among your peers, you're comfortable. And then when you, when you start school in Georgetown, you know, it's different and everybody's looking at you. Why are you talking like that and stuff, the, 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 the children from Georgetown? So it was very, very difficult for me. And I found myself, like my self-confidence, you know, dip because you were afraid to say the wrong thing and you found yourself trying to shape your language to fit in with the other children. But surprisingly, although I grew up speaking Creolese predominantly, I did very well in English. So, um, my point is that it can exist together. I think I've been doubly introduced. Unfortunately, I had planned to say nothing. <laughs> Let me be quite honest. I was quite prepared to hear everything that was going on. But uh, I think there are a few issues that I just want to touch on very slightly. I can start by telling you a little story. I'm Arita Trinidadian, and we live in Trinidad. And I say to my wife, rub my foot for me. And she starts to rub my foot. And I say, not day, man, by my calf. She said, but Ian, that's not your foot. I say, that's you. That's my foot. <laughs> right? If you want to rub my leg, it's all right, but that's my foot. <laughs> and um, clearly, it reflects my very Guyanese, the very Guyanese dimension of my existence and of my language. The issues that are being raised, that have been raised, are very, very, very complex indeed. And I want to make maybe just a point or two, and well, people in here know me, so I, they know I will offer assistance. I, I'm ready to assist as far as possible. I think what is excellent about this session is that it moves towards what I like to call language awareness. It's been a long time in coming. People just don't recognize the need to be aware of the languages and of the issues that are involved in those things. People are not even aware, and Elsa was quite right, that the teachers don't always speak English. This is a what? This is a what can be English. Or what this does? Not English either. But every teacher in here, let me see the teacher in here that's never asked a class what this does. Every one of you including me. <laughs> what is this? Not this is a what. What does this do? Not <laughs> what this does. <laughs> All right. Um, so the level of awareness that we need, I think, is exceedingly high. And I think that we need to develop that sense of awareness. And even as we approach policy, 
we need to dis we need to ensure that we know with a with a we approach it with a new kind of knowledge and understanding what has happened. For instance, in Curacao, there's a school that teaches from kindergarten to university level in Papiamento, which is a creole of the island. It's a small island. Okay? It's their national language, and they use it right through the system. Okay? Now, I raise that because there, they have the advantage of being Dutch-oriented. And who wants to learn Dutch? Not even the Dutch people don't want to speak it. <laughs> so they have to find alternatives. But in our own cases, I think we need to develop a certain sense of self and self-assurance and be able to deal with ourselves as speaker of, speakers of Creole and we also need to ensure that we set for our education system the right sets of objectives and that we identify the kinds of knowledge that we need at each level. Those teachers who are neither fish nor fowl uh, need to understand a lot more than they do about English and about Creole because they don't know a hell of a lot about Creole either. They speak it. Like, like we all could do. But to understand all the implications, I think is generally beyond most people. So it's got to become part of our education process from long before they get into secondary school with the problems that we address. And they've got to become accustomed to being comfortable with the language and with recognizing, and the teachers have got to develop and the system have got to develop if we end up in any class with an English target, then we need to develop the right strategies for ensuring that our Creole-speaking students will develop the English that they need without losing any of the Creole that they have. All right? And the system has got to be sensitive to that. Um, when one of my former students sitting next to me here said, when are you going to speak? I said, I need a half an hour. <laughs> so I'm not going to take any more time, but I really want to raise these issues because I think that they are central to issues of policy. I'm Michelle Foster. I'm not a linguist by any means, but I'm just sitting here kind of listening to everything. And what comes to mind in terms of the policy, has it, has it been done somewhere else? On another, in another Caribbean country where Creolese has been accepted and incorporated. And I think my concern is I see the way people write nowadays, yeah, whether it's my generation or even younger. And I cringe at the way, you know, sentence or structure. And my concern is if we don't promote and encourage the standard English, that that's just going to get even worse. So that, that is my concern because that is the language that we do business in in the world. Yeah, I think, I think the idea is not to promote one over the other, right? but to give them, give both equal foot in. And I guess going back to the, the idea of being bilingual, right? Or plural. Right. Good morning. I'm nowhere close to education. I worked in the prisons. But I have a sister um, who was very um, uh, much uh, known in the education circles at UG and at the Teachers Training College, Shirley Henry. And um, so in that environment, I got an appreciation of what English is and what uh, Creolese is, because I'm a Creolese-speaking Guyanese. I recall a session similar to this in 1969 or 70 by, with Dr. Alsop at the Critchell Labor College when he sought to um, make a compendium of Creolese terms. I think it is in existence because as a participant, I was given a copy. Where it has gone to, I really can't tell at this stage. But I, keep, I have the language. Now, I was of the opinion uh, that both sets of expressions, because we call them languages, but they are really expressions of how we communicate. Um, I live in Canada for the last uh, 20 years. And 
near to Jamaicans. The Jamaicans will speak their patois. I don't understand any of it. But yet, they will break into English quite competently and speak what we regard as English. I love English soccer. And English, not only English, the teams in Europe are comprised of persons from all over the world, including non-English speaking persons. And the, 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 the language or of communication is English. So I would like to see uh, the, the co uh, coexistence of both the Creolese language, as we know it in Guyana, and the English as we communicate with the wider world. Right, I had you fooled. I only spoke for a short time before, but I do have a lot to say. And the one thing I'd like to um, indicate is that we don't have to be afraid at all about having Creolese and English coexisting. Other countries um, speak uh, mother tongues um, and have a very small population speaking it. For example, Luxembourgish, right? Luxembourg is a tiny little country in Europe that preserves its um, native tongue, Luxembourgish, but children at school learn English, um, sorry, not English first, but German, French, Luxembourgish. So by the time they're 10, they're already ready to start English, um, Spanish, French, Latin, whatever, at secondary level. So um, to have Creolese as part of our, edu of our primary education is not something really fantastic. It's just a matter of um, really accepting that this can be done and that we have to find a way to do it. It's not really rocket science. Okay, mine is about um, Nigerian uh, experience. In Nigeria, we have up to about 200 and something languages. <laughs> So you can imagine that. Well, the official language is English. Um, there, because we have these 200 and something languages, we have what we have three major languages. That's the Yoruba, the Hausa, and the Igbo. And these three major languages are emphasized in the school system. Well, depending on the location of the, of the school, because we have 36 states. Then this, uh, among these three, there are these three uh, major languages. Dep like I said, depending on the location of the school, we okay, sorry, depending on the location of the school, one of them is made compulsory up to what we call the GSS three level. That's um, when you say GSS three. But we, the, the, the secondary school we have six years for secondary school. So the GSS three level, the one of them is made compulsory. Every, all the students must um, of, must do the, the, the one of the major languages. That's it. But at, after the GSS three, anyone who chooses to do it up to the CSE level is allowed to do that. However, the English language is emphasized. You mo everyone must pass the English language, just like we have, um, you have it here in Guyana. So we can think about that. Well, apart from these 200 and something languages we're talking about, we have also Pidgin. This Pidgin is just like this Creolist we're talking about, but it is not encouraged. <laughs> That's it. It is not encouraged in the classroom because we believe that it affects the English language. So it's, it's a sense situation. One of the things that I want uh, the entire panel to remember, um, just to make sure that... In, yeah, the whole... <laughs> I want to make sure that you remember that um, there is a, a degree of misunderstanding within the Guyanese society. And because of uh, the dominance of the Westminster system on us, uh, we tend to condemn, criticize, and if possible, demean, uh, simply because of um, who you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying because of the dominance of the Westminster system on us as Guyanese, um, some folks were, were told bad things and, and when you appear, and the language that you speak, the way in which you, you, you're talking, um, many tend to condemn you 
and, and there is laughter behind it. Uh, we talk about bullyism in the States and we try to address it, but I think um, our constitution needs to start addressing some of the advantages that's been taken on someone because of his or her way of expressing himself. And Guyanese love to laugh at one another. It's, it's a common practice. But what I wanted to point out is that, and you can tell me if we were able to bring it out into drama, I tried to connect the home, the school, and the community. You notice that we saw the home, and we saw a big dilemma in the home with literacy, and the, the schoolyard represents the community, and an experience, the children's lived experience of the killing of the crapo, and one child feeling compassion for the crapo. And as Karen said, if education is not about taking our lived experience and making meaning out of it and developing ourselves out of it, what else is education about? And that lived experience is lived in Creolese. Okay, English, sorry to disappoint us, but for Guyana, English is secondary, but there's nothing. When we develop that Creolese, English will have, will find its place because the children will grow in esteem and understand their place in the wider world. So it will be, be, we will in fact become an independent country that has its own language. I'm, I'm preaching now, Professor Robinson. <laughs> he doesn't like this part of me at all. Charlene. Charlene, research is not about proving anything. You know, I'd like you to follow up on the, on, on the question that uh, Michelle asked which is where in the Caribbean has this been done before and to the, what is yes. success? Yes. Dr. Robertson, you want to speak to it? I did raise the issue of papiamento in Curaçao and it being very successfully used through the system. And in fact, I've gone to a university class at the university in Curaçao where in fact the class was conducted in papiamento. And this wasn't just because I was there, it was what they do normally in that particular instance. Um, in Jamaica, former student of mine, now colleague, Hubert Devnish, has managed to convince the Jamaica, in fact was invited by the Jamaican government eventually, to prepare and to work on a bilingual program which has so far indicated reasonably high levels of success and competence in the students both in terms of what they learn, how they learn, and their ability to use both languages. Now, let me say something about that, because I keep hearing terms that disturb me, and this is why I didn't want to start talking, you know. Um, some terms disturb me. When you say uh, move to or improve, those, those terms are value-laden. And you have to be careful, because in a sense, your own mind is playing tricks on you. And one has to be careful with those things. So there's the, there's the case in Jamaica. Um, if you go to the Trinidad government website, you'll see that their language policy, the official policy, with which I had a lot to do, does talk about these issues in some very specific ways, which I think um, apply to Guyana as well. And perhaps Guyana is even clearer in that sense than Trinidad was. So that, the, and, and if you look at Suriname, Sanantongo is written, it's published, it's used. Sarmakan, same thing. Hindi, they call it Hindi, same thing. Japanese, Javanese, sorry, same thing. In Suriname, so that if we want to find examples, we wouldn't be short of them. I'm not going to mention Charlene and her work here because that will make people feel that I'm, I'm patronizing. <laughs> but the, the point is that these are issues that have been mulled over for a long, long time. And they are coming to a head now because we have the consciousness, the knowledge, and the ability to address them in very real ways. So it is true. The other thing I'm going to say is this that even though the territories which are English-oriented do, do place high emphasis on English, they do not, and CXC as a, as a former 
reasonably senior person in the CXC examining process, um, it does not actively reject the use of um, Creole in specific circumstances. What it argues, and it's, logically, it's logical, is that if you are writing an examination that certifies your competence in English, then we have to certify your competence in English. The, the downside of that is that they should also be saying, but if you want to really get control of English, you have to move from the known to the unknown. And that is the part that the system doesn't address at all. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not as straightforward as we think it is, but it is doable, it is necessary that it be done, and we need to be as informed as we possibly could be to help all the, all the, all the, um, the persons who have interest in it. And he made me realize something I need to tell you also. The primary school timetables do not have a subject called English. So we, I say to the teacher, so which language are you teaching? And he said, but English, miss? I said, where is it? Where is that? Where is that? Right? So, miss, but we have it. Is grammar? Is spelling? Is this? I said, but which language? Like Dr. Hines was saying yesterday at the plenary session, when the child jump in the trench, he say, boujoum. <laughs> but they don't see boujoum right on the paper. But I could spell boujoum for you because I learned to spell Guyanese. But that orthography or writing system, I call it a carefully guarded secret. Next time I'll send them a bill. <laughs> Look, people have been writing Creole for the longest while. At least 40 years ago, no, 50, 52, there was a, a, a system set up for writing Jamaican. Derek Bickerton, in the 60s, established, well, adopted, that, adapted that system to Guyana. All of us who have come after that, John Rickford, Hubert Devonish, Richard Alsop, well, Richard didn't come after, after Bickerton. But those of us who have been working in the area have used the system, have adapted the system, making adjustments relevant to the Guyanese context, but still managing to keep it wholesome. And since you started with Sam Selvon, or somebody mentioned Sam Selvon, Amina, was it you? In Trinidad, they have a kind of dog that is called a pothong. That's how Sam Selvon starts one of his short stories. All right? And what is fantastic, the most, one of the most celebrated of the Ghana poems is the University of Hunger, the Wide Waste, is the Pilgrimage of Man, the Long March. Now, let me tell you, it's not, is the University of Hunger the Wide Waste, which is the English question, is the Creole sentence, is the, are the university of hunger? Are me? Are you? All right? We all. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> and that's Martin Carter. Yes. So, so we, we, uh, you know, I, I, we really have to, I'd love to have you, right? But it's, it's 11, it's 11 o'clock and we have to wrap up because the subsequent, the next session is about to start, right? But I think, I think this is absolutely wonderful, right, that we're all here today. Everyone seems to be engaged. Many questions were asked. I thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, I thank uh, Miss Charlene, uh, the, um, the Buxton Arts Theater, and particularly you for coming and for really helping to make this panel what it is, right? I have a couple of housekeeping uh, issues or, uh, to mention. Uh, those of you who have the, um, the program, there, we, we have a few, a couple of changes. So uh, at 1 p.m., we'll have uh, Mr. Bob Semple uh, will do his slow fire presentation. Uh, I believe it's in the main auditorium, uh, followed by um, uh, panel number 14. Instead of room B02, it's in the main auditorium. Uh, and then we also have panel number 18, which is uh, the science and technology, will also be in the main auditorium. And that, is, that starts at, uh, at 3.30. Uh, I'd also like to like, strongly encourage you to visit the digital tent, Ryan. Uh, I, it's downstairs and outside, like at the front, 
Brian, we, there's a book fair going on. Um, and I really encourage you to participate actively in the panels and when you have some free time to uh, partake in uh, the other activities we have to supplement what it is we're discussing here. But thank you very much, Ryan. Um, uh, if, 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 uh, if, if, member, if people want to follow up or have something else, is there some way we can follow up with you? Yes. Comment, put your name and email address down or your contact number. Okay. That's something I would uh, to do. So, yes. I would love to do that because um, my responsibility is uh, with the City of North. I'm the chair of the Caribbean Commission. Okay. And so we will there, get there's, No, there's a lot of work that I want to do with the, with the panel. Here, I made a huge boo-boo. Huge boo-boo. I have uh, Mr. Aleem, right? And we... And we totally, uh, we totally took all of the time, but I really would ask you, to, could you please accommodate him because he has some wrap up. And you know, because of the questions, so, so Mr. Ali, and I really apologize. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, first of all, I think we need to give uh, a, a stronger round of applause to the performers. I don't, think, I don't think we did them justice um, because in their presentation, they touched, the presentation included a number of issues, language and otherwise, that affect our school system. And for me personally, the performances, the, 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 the actors were excellent. So give them a strong round of applause. And of course, the script writer, I believe Charlene, you wrote the script. So whoever wrote the script, excellent script. And for the use of the space and everything, it's a dramatic production, which is excellent. And w whenever I need a dramatic group, I will remember the Buxton Theatre Arts Group. So big, the big them up. Um, secondly, give yourselves a round of applause. Um, because even though I was a bit sidelined here, um, all of the questions, you did my work to an extent because those were the questions I was going to raise and those were the directions I was going to point to. Um, I, coming here thinking about being a respondent on this panel, I was thinking how many people would come to a performance on language? And I was thinking perhaps you'll have about four or five persons. I know Professor Robertson would be here and so on, but I think we'd have about one or two other persons, but we have a full house. And not only a full house, but, a, but packed lots of questions, excellent audience involvement, and very pointed, relevant, and important questions. Now, coming out of all of that, here is what I want to see. That the matter is not simply a question of language teaching methods or approaches. That is the tip of the iceberg. That is a technical work. That is important, yes, but it's a technical work that we need to do. For me, the important thing is the cultural matter. And that is what came out of all of the questions. Um, the acceptance of the Creole the role and function of the Creole language, which is for me a question, of our, a question of our own cultural viability, importance, growth, and direction. And if we can't start with that, we will get nowhere on the question of the Creole being a language in schools. So that for me is a fundamental question. The second important question is, what is English? And Elsa, my wife, I'm glad she raised that question, so big her up for that. <laughs> Yeah, the question that, um, and I recently wrote a paper which is going to appear in, a, in a, one of the publications coming out of this conference is that same question, what is English? Um, there's a book, I don't know, Ian might remember the book, it's an article written by Pauline Christie. She, uh, the, the article is, Wither English in the Caribbean. If you can find that article, Wither English in the Caribbean by Pauline Christie, I think it's in the a uh, memorial book for Professor Alsop. I think it's one of the first articles in that book. The question is, what is English? And even if we recognize the role and value of English, we must address the question of what is English in terms of, first of all, what people believe English to be from what they learned about in high school 20, 30 years ago from the little pieces they have picked up from their readings and their own education years ago. Secondly, international developments in English 
and the concept of international English, the concept of Caribbean English, the concept of Guyanese English, and the concept of mistakes in English, whether you're writing English or you're making a mistake, and an important gray area, what is English and what is Creole, or what is Creolese, because sometimes one shades into the other and it looks like English, but it might be Creole, or it looks like Creole, or it might be English. So those are two fundamental matters to address. Um, the whole question of broken English is another matter. Um, what is broken English? And what is Creole? Because some people see Creole as being broken English, ungrammatical English, and it might not be. And some people who champion English are themselves speaking broken English, but because that is what they believe English to be, they say, this is what we, mu this is what we must say. And sadly, as Elsa pointed out, the teachers in school um, are perpetuating grammatical mistakes in English and so on. And Ian, you yourself, you wrote an article in which you said, and I quoted you in my article, that even at the highest levels of our society, people are functioning in non-English, and they are becoming the models for students and teachers. So we're perpetuating a system. So for me, an interesting area where technical linguistic work has to be done is in clarifying what is English and what is Creole, and um, how we, how we, how we fo um, focus on that. Um, the Ian made a point about value-less terminologies, um, and we must be careful about that. Now, for me, there's a concept, there's a word that's being used, dialect, and even Creole and Creolese. People say we must speak dialect, and dialect is important, and Creole is important. But when they, when they give the examples of why it is important, the examples are that it is important because it comes from our four parents, because we have proverbs in it, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it seems to be that even while we're championing Creole or dialect, we are putting it into a ghetto. We are marking it off as something cultural and, and something not in the mainstream. It is out of the mainstream. Let me give you another example quickly. In the newspapers, they, are, they have made over the last 15 or 20 years, they have made a step into using verbatim Creole in the news reports. So they're saying, yes, that's very good. In our newspapers, you can see Creole written. But when and where do they use the Creole? They use it when some poor person has been robbed or beaten or somebody has been raped or something. So all the Creolese concerns violence, robbery, poverty, issues, and so on. So while the Creole is being quote unquote championed, it is also being marginalized and being put into a context. So we must be very careful about that, all right? Um, that we should see Creole, as some speakers have said, a way of thinking, a way of experiencing the world. And another important point is this, the values that we place on English, and we must understand language development. English is a dominant language all over the world today. But there was a time when English was not a dominant language, even in England. In 1066, after the Norman Conquest, French was the language of England in London, and English was a marginalized language somewhere out in the counties. But English has managed through um, slavery and expansion and colonialization to become an important language. Now, we must understand that languages have histories, and we must understand how marginalized languages become central languages. And we must, for example, the growth of science, the growth development of technology, how English became a language of science and technology, and so it became an important language. And we must try to place those same values to Creole and move Creole out of its cultural, marginalized, ancestry kind of place that we put it into and um, see it as a language that we can use for thinking and that we do have a philosophy. Yesterday at the plenary session, we had a, a presentation on Caribbean philosophy. And the presenter identified certain persons as being Caribbean philosophers. But 
why are ordinary people who speak religion, why aren't they Guyanese philosophers? Why aren't our proverbs, etc., also aspects of Guyanese philosophy? So there's a lot of um, cultural work that we have to do on two sides. One, cultural work on understanding and valuing our Creole and not making the mistake of shooting ourselves into the foot by marginalizing it even while we're championing it. And secondly, understanding the value and worldwide importance of English, but understand what English is or what is English and when we are speaking English and when we are not speaking English and also how English became and understand that English did spend many centuries becoming an international language and it, did, it wasn't a language that God gave to the world that we must always look up to and um, value and recognize. So many issues um, and as I said I like the way that all of you have raised these issues and probably what we should all do is to go back to our own little corners of the world and continue the fight. And then we can probably have a broader base um, on which to make this movement um, into Creole being a valued language. So thank you very much for the time to respond to you. Thank you.